I'm glad that you all here survived the Easter handover with church. You know, a, a lot of times we build it up so much. It's kind of interesting when I was uh, kind of putting together last week's uh, message. One of the things I kept coming across from other pastors is how a lot of times Easter really burns them out. You wouldn't expect that. But a lot of times they're actually tired of Easter. Why do I say that? Because as Christians, the resurrection of Christ is not a one week thing out of the year. So it can almost be frustrating for a lot of pastors. And I'm telling you this from personal experience, too. It can be frustrating to build up one day as if that's the only day we really need to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So thank you for coming back the next week. For not thinking that, oh, you, you, know, you put in your duty, you did the Easter service, and you're here next week. Because guess what? It's just as relevant right now as it was Easter last week. Amen. Just as relevant. So thank you that you're hungry, you're passionate. Uh, let's pray for the uh, the rest of our church who might have a little bit of an Easter hangover. Uh, you know, get them back in here. Uh, so, just one quick question: How many of you would prefer 10:30 on Sunday mornings, or no? No. I got some hands, Josh. Do you like 10? I have a question. What's if that? it turns to be 10:30, then it'll be quarter to 11. Right. No, then we'll lock the doors <laughs> and we'll charge. We'll charge 20 percent uh, tithing. <laughs> <laughs> so just a thought. I, it's, it's running around my head here. Thirty. I was thinking more like eight o'clock actually. You, you can join the worship team. Good luck singing at eight o'clock. Right. Ten's good. Ten's good. All right. 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 You know, I, I would prefer 11, but that's uh, if we had multiple services. Yeah, we'll get the, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, I get too hungry. All right, so last week we kind of started, uh, we, we went based on, uh, I sent out some papers and had you write down what are some of the greatest uh, fears that you're, you're dealing with in life. And, and the, the most common ones that came back were stress, time, just being too busy, not, not being able to do it all, uh, health. Speaking of health, man, I've had this little bug I just can't kick for a whole week. How, how about you guys? Anyone else start, start going with a little bit of health? Yeah, let's pray for that one. Health, uh, it was loneliness and finances. It was, those are the, the most common ones that kind of came back. And last week we did look at, at loneliness a little bit and how the cross of Christ can relate to that and speak truth into our own loneliness. You know, that, that, we're, that we're never alone. You know, he, he abolished that. On the cross, and he, he, we have perfect communion with him at all times now. Yeah, and this week, I kind of want to just kind of look at more of a broad perspective. You know, what might be purpose of some of our problems? Before we try to find solutions to get rid of them all, let's let's try to kind of step back and look and say, what what might God be doing in in our problems in life? What kind of things might be going on that might be a bigger picture that we can't fully see just right off the bat? You know, are we just trying really to get rid of any discomfort, or if we really pause and and, and, you know, and try to get God's perspective on things, what might be, He be doing in our lives through these things? You know, one of the things that I, I really want to be honest about in, in this church is is our Christian life. You know, there's a lot of what I feel to be a lot of dishonesty about what the Christian life is out there. A lot of preaching that you'll get, I feel, is not genuine. And it kind of rubs me the wrong way, unfortunately. I'm just being honest with you about myself. But we want to be honest about the Christian life here in this church, what it really comes down to. You were honest about the difficulty of sometimes living the Christian life. You know, we don't want to gloss it over. We don't, we don't want to sugarcoat things. I just never had, I never got along with sugarcoating. It just didn't, it just never you know, sat well in my stomach. I don't like to sugarcoat what it is to be a Christian. Yeah, we trust Christ and we trust all that He's done. And we're children of the living God. But you know, becoming a Christian is something that's easy. You know, we, we can easily you know, repent and believe and, you know, and follow God. But there are moments when it can get tough. And things don't always go our way. Sometimes people will treat you badly. And sometimes you know, we, we will treat others badly. And we'll be the person. And we're thinking, God, I'm supposed to be a better person than this. What's happening? Sometimes we do things that we immediately regret in our lives. And at times, things seem to happen for no reason whatsoever. You know, we can't put a reason. God, why is this happening right now? 
So this morning, I kind of want, to, I want us to consider this question. It's going to kind of frame what we talk about this morning. Is there any redeeming value to the problems, the troubles, and fear that, that, that is in our lives? Okay, is there any redeeming value of it? Before we try to get rid of it right away, is there something we can get from it that would be of worth in our, in our Christian walk, in our faith? First of all, we know God is sovereign. That can throw a couple wrenches in our beliefs here. That really causes some theological problems. Sometimes, you know, looking at the world, thinking he's sovereign. Well, God, if you're sovereign, why all this stuff? We know he's all-knowing. So there's nothing that happens that God doesn't know about. He knows all future events that are going to take place. And that, that includes all future events in our lives as well. Wow. Things start to get a little bit more cluttered here. What's going on? With God. What, what, what does He have in mind here? He knows when our hard times are coming, and He knows when we get into them. He, he's all knowing, He knows all future events. So, why, the question, why does He let them happen? Why would He let them happen? What can God possibly accomplish through our hard times or our bad times? What can God be thinking by letting people suffer through hard times? And does He even care? That we're going through some of this stuff. Some of the sicknesses that we've gone through. Some of the, the loss of family. Some of the, the fighting. Some of the, the terrible situations that some of us find us in. Does he care about those things? There's a story in the Bible I want to look at this morning. It, it, it can kind of give, it's not going to give every answer at all. But it's going to kind of give us a glimpse in, into how we might begin to answer this question. How we might begin to get a bigger picture of things. And it's a, it's a story we've all read before. It's in Matthew 14. You can go ahead and put on the board there, Josh. Matthew 14, verse 22 through 33. And immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So once again, this is, this is his idea. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Why don't you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for each person that, that came here this morning that is desiring more of you and that, that wants to seek after your face right now. I pray that you would make yourself real to us right now, that you would just make yourself present, kind of as you just showed up in the, in the middle of that storm that they were in, just show up right here in the middle of us right here as we gather. For that you would speak to us your truth, and Holy Spirit, we ask you to reveal to us what it is you want to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's a pretty big event that happened right before this story we just read. You know, anyone know what happened the, the moment before, if you didn't look at the, the cliff notes here? No? He fed the 5,000. Right before this. You know, right before this story, you know, he, he fed at least 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and three fish. It's a supernatural occurrence, right? That's not something that you could just, it's not physically, humanly possible to do that. You know, it had to be something amazing for them to witness and see. Yeah, and this, the disciples, they're right in the middle of all of this. You know, and and you know, they, they took the food to the people and Jesus multiplied it. You know, over 5,000 people probably. They only counted the men. Uh, they didn't count the women and children. So it's probably a lot more than 5,000, actually. So, and, and it says, you know, verse 22, when we started out this, this portion, it says, they immediately, Jesus put the disciples into the boat. 
So they're, they're, what they're doing is, you know, this huge crowd is gathered around them. And what, what's he doing? He's getting them away from the crowd right away. He, he's seeking a place. But he's the one that put them in the boat. Well, what? Why in the world would Jesus put them on a boat? And he's, he's sovereign. He's all-knowing. He knows what's going to happen, but he put them in a boat. You know, it's, and and the, the interesting thing is, it's as soon as they witness a large miracle. So you have this occurrence in life where there's this big buildup of faith and something amazing they've just seen. Wow, God, you're so real, you're so huge. And all of a sudden, he puts them into this boat, and he stays behind. And he's praying by himself while they're out, and they run into a storm. He knew this was going to happen. He put them in that boat. He stayed behind, and they hit a storm. It must have been a terrifying storm for them to be in. You know, they got into the boat before evening had came, as verse 25 says, they didn't see Jesus until the fourth watch. So what's the fourth watch? Uh, Roman time, that's probably between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So they're out in this boat for probably around 9 to 12 hours, in, in fighting a storm without Jesus around, in a boat that he put them in and left them in. You know, and sometime around this time, between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., on the fourth watch, Jesus comes walking out to them on the water. Now, they were so scared but that, that, that they thought they were seeing a ghost at this time. They were terrified. They didn't know what was going on. But it was Jesus, God's Son. He was overcoming all the laws of physics, and just walking on water. And we all know what happens next. Peter decides to get out of the boat and try for himself. He starts to walk on the water as well. But as he's walking towards Jesus, he loses his focus and he starts to sink. He starts to go down. He yells out, Jesus, save me. He yells out for him to save him. And Jesus does. And there was nothing left for the disciples to do here. You know, after he saves him, their only response is they begin to worship. And what do you say at this point? They just began to worship him. They became aware immediately of who Jesus was. There's sirens here. And he's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's above all the laws of the universe, walking on water, saving him from, from a dire situation. He's controlling nature. So they're just in awe. They're just worshiping him at this point. So kind of, let's take all of this that we've just said and let's kind of come back to our first question that, that I asked you this morning. Is there any redeeming value to our problems, our troubles, and fear in our lives? What can God possibly accomplish through our hard times? What might He be doing through these things? You know, the first thing I want to say is that sometimes Jesus puts us in tough situations. Is that hard for you to, to, to accept? I mean, we see evidence of it right here. He put them into the boat, knowing a storm was going to come. So sometimes Jesus will put us in tough situations. You know, verse 22 says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. I mean, there, that's all the evidence we need. He knew what was going to happen. It, it's almost like the disciples had no choice about getting into the boat. If they were going to follow and listen to Jesus, then they were going to get into that boat. That was his will. It's what he told them to do. You know, they, he insisted that they got into that boat. And you know, Jesus, being fully God, being fully sovereign, knew what the future would hold, and he told them to get into the boat. So what can we learn from this? What can we take out of it? You know, sometimes Jesus will put us in places of weakness or trouble so we can see him in ways that we can't see him in any other way. Sometimes we can't see Jesus in any other way unless we see him in times of weakness and trouble. The disciples are learning, you know, they were learning about, about, about Jesus in a way that they could not have learned any other way. They learned about what the Father was like, about God, about what God was like, that there was really no other way they could learn it. You know, they saw what he was like through his miracles. They just saw him feeding 5,000 people. That opened their eyes to more of who he was. They saw him, what he was like when he was healing the sick around them. That opened their eyes. He, he's a healer. He does these amazing things. You know, they, they saw what he's like in those situations. They saw the, the amazing things he did you know, throughout Jerusalem and all the miracles that he was doing. 
but their knowledge of him was still incomplete. There were still things about him they couldn't fully understand unless they experienced it. They had to see his great works when their whole world was falling apart. They had to know that he still cared about them if it looked like they were going to die. If the world seemed to be crashing around them, they had to know that he still was there in those times as well. They had to see that he was going to go through any measure, whatever it took, to deliver them out of their trouble. They had to know that he was there for them in the good times, but also in the storms, also in their troubled times. You know, there's things that we can't learn about our Savior. When I mean, you think about that word, Savior, why do we need a Savior if we don't need to be saved? You know, there's things they couldn't learn about the Savior until they were in trouble. Until they're in dire situations. When, when everything's going great, we understand that Jesus is amazing and he's wonderful. I mean, thank you, God. Life is so awesome right now. We understand that part about him. But it's the hard times that we find out Jesus is not only great and wonderful, but that he still cares and he's still with us. That there's not a dire situation that separates us from him. That there's not, just because things seem to be falling apart, does not mean that we've lost his favor, we've lost his care, that we've lost his love. He's in the middle of the situations. And sometimes he'll walk on water just to be with us in our trouble. He'll do the impossible just to meet us in those places that we're at in life. And sometimes he'll put himself in the middle of our storms, so that we're not sinking all alone. You know, some of us have felt like we're sinking. I know what it's like. I mean, you know, ever since the, you know, I've been working at the nuclear plant, and ever since that closed, it's been a tough road to get that next job. And sometimes I feel like I'm sinking. But you know what? It's I've still had everything provided for me. You know, I've still had. You know, I've never lacked a thing, no matter what. And, and, and I'm learning that no matter what situation I'm in, he's with me in that. It's a hard lesson sometimes, but, but it's becoming real to me that no matter how things look on the outside, Jesus is always in this situation with you. Amen. The next thing, this is a really, I think, one of the most important things we can ever learn through our hard times. And it's a tough one. Trouble brings us to an end of ourselves. Whoa. Trouble brings you to an end of yourself. You know, the disciples, they've been fighting the storm for probably, possibly up to 12 hours. I mean, imagine how fatigued they were. Imagine how, how tired, how over it they were in the middle of the storm. 12 hours of not getting anywhere. Have you ever tried swimming against a riptide? And it's pulling you out, and you're just not getting anywhere, and you're just, next thing you know, you're, by the way, if you ever caught riptides, swim to the side. Just so, you're, just so you're aware. Don't swim against it. You won't win. I remember it, when I was in, in uh, YWAM, we had a kid from Korea, and he didn't really know about the ocean. And uh, one, one time we were just like, where is that? You know, it's been over 10 years. I can't remember his name. We're like, where is he? And we didn't know where he was. And next thing you know, he luckily dyed his hair. He bleached it, and it turned bright orange. <laughs> and someone looked out in the way in the ocean and they saw his orange hair as he's literally like gulping water at this point. And they ran out there and they got him. He almost died. He's swimming straight against the riptide. I mean, if you're fighting and fighting until you're exhausted, it's luckily, luckily he had a bad hair dye. <laughs> it saved his life. It saved his life. It really did. He had orange hair and they were able to see it in the middle of the ocean as he was, if you didn't know, it did not fight directly against it. All of his energy was, was taken up. He had no, nothing left in him. He was, he was start, his head was going under. He was starting to, to drink water right when somebody saw him. You can imagine that they had used all of their energy fighting against the waves. They were probably worn out. They probably realized there's nothing more they could do at this point. Nothing more. The, the thought probably crossed their minds, it's all over at this point. You know, I have, I've used every resource, I've used every bit of energy, I've tried so hard, and, and at this point, there's nothing left I can do. Now think about this one. Jesus could have come out to them earlier. He didn't have to wait until the fourth watch of the night. 
If he wanted to, he could have been out there in the first five minutes of the storm. Hey guys, I'm here. I, I deliver you from all things immediately, so you don't have to ever be uncomfortable. He could have been out there immediately in the first five minutes, but he didn't. He chose to wait. He chose to let them use all of their resources, all of their energy, and fail so that they would come to an end of themselves. He chose to let them get to the point where they had no chance on their own. And at that point, he came. He came to the rescue once they were fully exhausted of all the, everything else that they could possibly do to deliver themselves in the situation. And God will let us do that sometimes. If we have a tendency to think that we're going to go about life in our own intelligence, in our own strength, in our own savviness, with our own wealth, our own power, with our 401ks, if those things are protecting you, then you're not fully depending on God. He'll let us come to an end of ourselves before He shows up sometimes. Why is that? Because He wants us to depend on Him. Sometimes we let our own good desires get in the way of God's best desires. It's true. I mean, we think we can handle things in our own way. We think that we've got it figured out, we can do it in our own strength, that we've got it all under control. But there are times in life when we're in over our heads. There are times in life when it, no matter how much we try to dig ourselves out, it only seems to get worse, and there's nothing that we can do. And my first thing to say is I don't think it's entirely against God's will to, to let us go through those things sometimes. Because it's in those times when Jesus shows up that we learn about him in a way that we never could learn otherwise. We learn that we can take the worst situations and make something good out of them. We learn that he can take the worst situations and turn them into something good. Not that, 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 that he's causing these bad things to happen in life sometimes, but he's working them out so that they result in good. He can take your biggest screw up and he can redeem it. He can take your biggest mess up and he can make something good from it. He can take things that, would, that you've done against his will and he can take sins in your life and he can turn it around in the end and make it good. No, it wasn't his desire that he did some of these things, but he can still use them and work them out in the end for good. Do you believe that? You can take your dire situations and make them good. Now we learn it, going through these times that no matter how bad we mess up or how bad some other people mess up, he can still take all of that mess and he can still make it right. Wow. Now that's the kind of savior I serve. That's the kind of God I serve. Not the God who says, if you don't live by these 10 points of, of perfection in life, then you have no hope. I, I serve a God who says, guess what, you're like sheep. Sheep are dumb. Sheep do a lot of bad things. Sheep will follow each other off a cliff sometimes. He understands us. And he says, you know what, no matter how much you've done, I can still take those things, and I can still turn them around and make it good. I can still bring a good situation out of all of this junk. I mean, you've gone out, you've got caught up in a briar patch, and..." You got all this stuff, your hair's matted down. I mean, you're just, you're a mess. And he can turn it around and make it good. You know, he can be trusted when, you know, it, when times are the worst, just like you can trust him when your times are the best. And the next thing trouble can cause us to do is it can cause us to focus on Jesus. You know, even as Jesus showed up, Peter's troubles were about to get even worse. How about that? You think, okay, I'm out here struggling on my own, and now that I see Jesus walking towards me, it's all going to clear up. But what happened? As he's walking to Jesus, he starts to sink down into the water. And we sometimes talk about Peter, you know, talk bad about Peter. But you think about it, he's really the only guy who got out of the boat. You know, he had some faith to just to, to want to, you know, he's, he's, he's thinking, like, I can do that. Like, who, who of us thinks that? <laughs> I mean, we know how water works, but he's just thinking, you know, he's doing it, 
you know, I follow him. I can do it too. And he steps out of the boat. But what happens? As he's doing it, he loses focus. He takes his eye, eyes off Jesus for just a second and he begins to sink. And at this point, he's drowning and his instincts kind of kick in. And he does the only thing he knows how, you know, what to do. He screams. He screams out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. He knows that there's only one place left for him to turn. And he's focused on him. You know, it, it's sad to say, but many times when things are good, we have, a we have a tough time focusing on Jesus. Like, yeah, we're walking on the water. It's kind of amazing. We have this awesome experience. But it's in those times, a lot of times, we forget to keep our focus on Jesus. We're thinking things are just so good, I can just go about this with my own strength at this point. I can take care of it now. It's, it's really going well. We just kind of turn away. We forget. We forget where our focus should be. As long as, as long as things are kind of going along nicely and smoothly, we can be pretty confident. We can think we have it under control. And I think we'll just stay here in this good spot for a while. Let's stay where it's comfortable. Let's not go anywhere. You know, the, the Israelites even wanted to stay in slavery because they had... They knew where their bread was going to come from at some point. They didn't even want to go through the whole difficulty of being free, of being their own people. I mean, think about that. A lot of times we choose to stay in slavery bondage. We're comfortable. Sometimes it takes the tough times, sometimes it takes hard times to put our focus back on Jesus. A lot of times we start sinking and our Christian instincts kind of take over. You know, our instincts of, of where our, our focus needs to be takes over when we start sinking. And what do we do? We cry out to Jesus. God, I'm falling apart. I need you now. Before, we couldn't get ourselves to do that. We thought we had it. But once we find ourselves sinking, we, our focus comes back. The last big point, trouble gives us a reason to worship Jesus. Gives us a reason to worship him. You know, when it's all said and down, it's said and done, all the disciples could do at this point was worship Jesus. You think about that. I mean, they saw this miracle. They saw him coming out in the middle of the storm. They saw him, the Peter walking on the water. They saw him sink. They saw him get rescued. They saw the storm get calmed. And what was the response? Just in awe. Just worship. Just, you know what, God? There's no more words I can say. There's nothing else I can do. I just, I'm amazed at, at who you are, at what you're doing. They had seen him do a lot of amazing things. But they really got a bigger picture, a more complete picture of Jesus when they saw him come through in the middle of their trouble. When they saw him show up right there in their storm, they saw a bigger picture of who he was. They could do nothing but just acknowledge how amazing and how powerful and how mighty their Savior was. And his rescue brought them to spontaneous worship. I mean, have you ever seen those people that, or maybe you're one of them, who has gone through such, you know, such a wandering time in life before you know, BC, you know, before Christ. And once they've been delivered, there's just that joy that comes no other way. I mean, the people that I that I've known in my life who just have like the most contagious, infectious, enthusiastic joy about Jesus. Well, the ones who've really been delivered from a lot. I mean, I've just there's people I know who's, who I, I I knew this one one guy, you know, he, this guy at the church, and he was the guy who was sat at the very front row, and he was the guy who was clapping the loudest, who was excited, who just if you walked in that church, you know, he would notice you, be like, "How you doing, brother?" Just a big handshake, and he didn't go around telling his testimony, but I heard about it. I mean, he used to be a Chippendales dancer in Hollywood, <laughs> and he was shooting up coke. And heroin, and he was strung out, and he was suicidal, and he was in the deepest, darkest hole he could have ever been in. And when God delivered him from all those things, oh my gosh, he was on fire, excited, passionate, happy. I mean, there was joy that came out from this guy being delivered from dark times. I don't recommend going that path. <laughs> I'm saying if you've seen Jesus deliver you from trouble, then there's nothing left to do but just to worship, just to be thankful, just to be amazed 
at who He is. You know, we can all worship when things are going really good, but we can't get the full understanding of, of, of the greatness of Jesus until we experience Him rescuing us from our trouble. Unless we allow Him to pull us up in those times. It's that point we fully understand who our Lord and our Savior is. You're not just our financial advisor or our person who makes us feel good or who gives us five points on how to live a nice, happy, carefree life. We experience who our Savior is. Yes. I need a Savior. Yes. You know, I need more than self-help. Yes. I'm telling you right now, if that's all that I, my Savior is, that's not enough for me. No. I need more than self-help. I need <laughs> a Savior. Yes. Someone who's going to show up when I'm sinking and pull me up. Yes. And that's what He is. He shows up. And he is there in the good times. He's there in all the other times. But to get a complete picture, we've got to see him in all these different areas. So the question we asked at the very beginning, is there any redeeming value to our problems, our troubles, and fear in our lives? What can God accomplish through our bad times? And the answer is yes, there absolutely is. There's value in your problems, there's value in your fears, and there's value in your troubles. God will use them positively. And a lot of times, He'll even allow them for our own good. And you think, no, no, that's not for my good. A lot of times, He'll allow them for your own good. A lot of times, we need to be delivered from our own self-reliance. A lot of times, we need to come to an end of ourselves. A lot of times we need to get our focus back on Him. And a lot of times we need some new reasons to worship Him. A lot of times we forget why we do it. It becomes rote. It becomes habit. A lot of times we need that reminder of why we're worshiping Him. So those are just some of the reasons. You know, he'll allow them for our good. He'll bring us to an end of ourselves. He'll refocus ourselves on Him. And He'll give us reasons to worship Him. So my question is, are you going through hard times? <coughs> and it's safe to say that, yes, we've all, we all have something we're dealing with. And, you know, I'm not going to say they're always from God. I'm not going to say they're always, a lot of times they're a result of a fallen, sinful, bad world. And a lot of times they're a result of our terrible choices. We do those too. <coughs> but maybe God has allowed some of those situations, those hard times in your life. I mean, don't count it out. I mean, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Maybe God allowed those hard times in your life. And maybe he's really concerned about bringing you to an end of yourself. Maybe you've been so self-reliant and you're thinking you can always do it on your own. Maybe he wants to bring you to an end of yourself. And maybe he's trying to get you to put your focus back on you. And maybe he wants to give you new reasons to worship him. And he's our great, our awesome, our mighty Savior, our Lord. You know, so instead of just saying that, you know, we're going to be looking more at, at how Scripture speaks into these in, into these hurts in our lives, into the into the stress, the time, the finances, and all these things. We're, we're going to look at at you know God's truth in those. But this morning, I wanted to say first of all. Let's step back and, 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 and not dismiss all those things. But maybe let's ask God, you know, God, are you trying to tell me something through this? Are you doing something that I'm not seeing through this hard time in my life? Are you trying to get me to learn a lesson that I would have learned in no other way? Are you trying to get me to see who you are in a way that I just can't learn unless I go through something? And maybe that's the case for you this morning. And maybe you can find hope and encouragement in that this morning. You know, this is kind of off my notes, but I think a lot of times God will kind of have us go around and around until we learn a lesson. You ever find yourself with the same issues coming up over and over again? With the same problems, and you kind of feel like you're not getting anywhere? I mean, by the way, the children of Israel, they wandered 40 years until they learned their lesson. They're, they're, they're a picture of what we do in our lives, too. God's trying to get you to learn something. 
And are we like those children of Israel who, God, we're, you know, we're complaining, we're trying to get out of it, and we find ourselves wandering in circles in the wilderness for 40 years because we're just refusing to learn what God's trying to get us to learn. But what is that? That He is our King. That He is the one in charge. That He is the one that is going to lead us and deliver us. And He's, he's God. Not us. You know, I think God was really concerned about bringing the Israelites to an end of themselves. And what better way than to wander for 40 years in the wilderness where the only direction they had was following what, what he was doing. And so I would say if you find yourself with the same things that just keep coming up, with the same issue that you keep going over in life, ask God, God, is there something I'm trying to be, that you want me to learn in this right now? Am I just missing it right now? Have I been praying to deliver me from this with all the entire time forgetting that you might have a lesson that you want to teach me that I just haven't been listening to? Amen. So, worship team, why don't you come up? And, and you know, as we close, just I encourage you just to ask God, just in, in your own in your own prayer. God, what are you trying to teach me through? If there's a situation that comes to your mind, what are you trying to teach me? You know, maybe, maybe he's trying to bring you to an end of yourself. Maybe he wants you to focus on him. Maybe he wants you to have new reasons to worship him. And ask him, God, are you trying to, to do these things through this situation in my life? And maybe he'll reveal it to you. Maybe you'll understand more of what his purpose is in the world.